So uh, welcome to uh, the next session for the Vital Sites Pavilion. We will have uh, five speakers. Um, the focus of this panel presentation will be uh, the presentation of two global reports which were already launched uh, this year uh, in June. Uh, one by the ICCA Consortium on Territories of Life that you see on the screen and the second report on the lands and territories of indigenous peoples and local communities by a, cons by a group of different organizations which will be presented by WWF. And we will have two online presentations from the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center and uh, Giovanni Reyes from the Philippines. So by way of background, many of you will be aware of the 2018 uh, research by Garnett, um, which is often cited on the extent of indigenous peoples' uh, territories which are relevant to conservation. The two reports that were developed this year to some extent are an update on some of that research. The Garnett study had really only looked at indigenous people's lands and didn't include local communities and we'll hear from WCMC about that. Um, so my, my name is Terence Hady. I work with the GEF Small Grants Program in UNDP and I also manage the Global ICCA Support Initiative which is delivered through the S SGP program and have been uh, very uh, involved with many of the governance related uh, activities of the World Commission on Protected Areas uh, over the last uh, years and these uh, reports uh, are part of that uh, effort as well. Uh, I should add that uh, UNDP has also produced a global report last year. The 2020 Human Development Report was focused on the Anthropocene. Um, this was the first time that the HDR really tried to internalize the, uh, the human global ecological footprint and one of the dimensions to that was also a form of advocacy towards the um, lifestyles of, of, of indigenous peoples and local communities as being more compatible with um, a world which is of course uh, dominated by human beings, the focus being the Anthropocene. Um, we're also aware that the uh, IP BEST report from 2019, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, also looked at this the dimension of, of um, uh, nature conservation in relation to uh, land use and developed language which looked at uh, uh, comparing land sparing. Um, many of the events in this pavilion have been discussing the 30 by 30 target as opposed to what is maybe sometimes called land sharing in terms of human coexistence with biodiversity in the landscapes. So um, both of these reports are slightly different ways of, of uh, addressing the advocacy for uh, IPLCs, as we would um, maybe s uh, abbreviate. Uh, the Territories of Life report is um, very much through the ICCA Consortium, which is a membership-based uh, global movement. Um, and then the, uh, the global report from WWF and partners is in a sense taking a more macro perspective of, of the situation. Um, why is this uh, very relevant? Many events here at WCC this year are, are focused also on a rights-based approach. Um, how do we uh, further internalize human rights within the framework of, of conservation? Um, I would just add that I attended the pre-summit organized by the, some of the more activist NGOs, Survival International and um, the Rainforest Foundation UK, and uh, listened to, to what their critique was of, of the 30 by 30 and, and one of them was that uh, international donors like myself at the, at the UNDP and the GF have very good safeguards but they don't always um, implement them very well um, and uh, I think uh, it's a salutary, les a salutary lesson to reflect on, on the way in which funding also is channeled to uh, conservation whether it's through intermediaries or directly to indigenous peoples and local communities and so um, some of the advocacy is also to increase that uh, percentage of funding which goes uh, directly uh, to the ground um, and maybe just before passing the the, the floor to uh, Ame to present uh, the territories of life report I would just highlight that 
um, some of the international conventions on, on which are relevant to, to natural heritage, such as the World Heritage Convention, uh, are um, looking very closely at, at, at the way in which uh, existing normative instruments on human rights are or are not being applied, even though the guidance uh, is there. There was a session this morning um, looking at that. So um, finally, I would just uh, lastly say we, we uh, through the WCPA, this is the Protected Planet Pavilion, um, there's also, following the, the 2016 World Conservation Congress in Hawaii, an effort to look at situations of overlap between protected areas and ICCAs. That's not the, the focus of today's discussion. We had a session uh, yesterday morning on that, and, and we hope that that uh, best practice guidance will be finalized, uh, hopefully within the next uh, six months. So without further ado, I will now ask uh, Ame Ramos Castillo to uh, give us a, a, an overview of the Territories of Life report. So, por favor. Muchas gracias, Terence. Hola a todas, todos. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Ami Ali Ramos, and I am the International Policy Coordinator for the ICCA Consortium. And I have the great pleasure today to share with you our latest report on the territories of life. I would like to acknowledge that I do see members of the ICCA Consortium here. So I encourage you to talk to them after. They're rich in experience, probably more so than I am. So thanks for coming to all of those members who are here with us today. I see Christina is one of them here. So um, wonderful to see you. So I, would l I want to share this report more than anything because I've heard through the Congress a lot of conversations about conservation and protection. And at the CBD, this knowledge of protecting 30% and what that means. And he, we at the ICA Consortium talk about not conserved areas or indigenous protected areas, but we like to refer to them as territories of life because really what they are, are territories of life. They're not just biodiversity, they're not just human cultural diversity, they're a really interesting intermix of the human, the cultural, the tangible, the intangible, and the spiritual. So in our Territories of Life report, we wanted to capture all of this. Um, so we launched this report in May of this year, so it is fairly new, and the report is made up of uh, 17 case studies of territories of life. These are from the ground grassroots case studies that showcase the rich experience that indigenous peoples and local communities have in conserving protection and protecting and using nature. It also includes six national and regional analysis, as well as a global spatial analysis with UNEP and WCMC that complements the second report that we'll hear about today on the state of IPLC lands. I wanted to show this to give you an idea of the vast diversity of richness of case studies that were used to, to prepare this report. And so they range from all over the world, from different, oh, from different grassroots communities to, uh, I hope everyone's okay over there, um, from different grassroots communities to uh, local communities to indigenous communities and the strategies uh, they use to protect and uh, conserve nature. There are a couple of key findings that I want to focus on. I know we don't have enough time, so I would encourage everyone who would like to know more to visit the report website and you can click on each one of those case studies and I'll share more information about that. The first key finding is indigenous peoples and local communities play an outsized role in the governance, conservation and sustainable use of the world's biodiversity and nature. I think we've all known this, and especially if we are conservationists here today who have worked with indigenous people, it's kind of an obvious finding, but we were able to put together these case studies to really document and prove that this is indeed the case. There's about 21% of the world's territory is potential ICCAs, which is about the size of Africa. That's huge when we think about the remaining world's biodiversity. Our second key finding was that indigenous peoples and local communities have extensive contributions to a healthy planet. And these contributions are rooted in relationships, relationships between each other, relationships in their culture, relationships with their governance systems and with their collective lands and territories. This is really rich. Everything they do is rooted in these relationships. <laughs> 
The third key finding is indigenous peoples and local communities are the de facto custodians of many official protected and conserved areas, and that they are also conserving a significant proportion of lands and nature outside such areas. This is really key. We talk about protected areas and we talk about these as areas that are protected by rangers and managers and the government. But if we look at the evidence, actually indigenous peoples and local communities are the custodians of these official areas. The fourth key finding is that indigenous peoples and local communities are at the front lines of resisting the main drivers of global biodiversity loss and climate breakdown. And often they face retribution and violence for doing so. These are people who are out there against the mining, the extractive industries, development, uh, all kinds of, of um, pressures on their lands and territories. And they are in, on the front lines defending these territories. We talk a lot about environmental defenders of nature, the, the, um, the defense, or environmental defenders as something. But at the ICCA Consortium, we talk about defenders of life because they're not just defending nature, they're defending themselves, they're defending the identity, and they really are defending nature for humanity. So these are frontline defenders of life, and they are often um, right there in the middle of it. The fifth key finding is that indigenous peoples and local communities have made key advances and continue to persist in pursuit of self-determination, self-governance, peace, and sustainability against all odds. They are there and they continue to be there. And if you speak with many of them, they will say, I will never stop the struggle. I will never stop the fight because then I don't exist and the generations after me don't exist. And so they, despite all odds, are doing this gracefully, willingly, sustainably, efficiently with huge results. So our key message is, what did we want this report, or what does this report really convey to the conservation community? That indigenous peoples and local communities are the true agents of transformative change. They really are the true agents of transformative change. And supporting them to secure their rights and collective lands and territories of life is the biggest opportunity to address the interlinked biodiversity and climate crises. Uh, we are very involved in the CBD negotiations, and this has continuously come up about investments, like where do people invest and how governments want to invest in the protection of nature. And really investing in securing the collective rights and land tenure of indigenous peoples is the best investment for getting the biggest gains of biodiversity conservation. So we did want to share with you a couple of the recommendations that came out of our report. The first recommendation was that to recognize and respect the central role of indigenous people and local communities in sustaining a healthy planet. They are out there on the front lines doing this work and we must, we must make it a priority to recognize them, their contribution and their right. That has to happen. The second recommendation is that we must support indigenous people and local communities to secure their collective lands and territories and sustain themselves on their own terms. And I think this for us is key at the ICA Consortium. I think a lot of the work that's been done in nature conservation is very much focused on experts. You know, people who come and tell you, this is how you must conserve. And really what we must do is support them to continue the work they're doing on their own terms with their own governance systems. The third recommendation, which is key for, for the work that we're doing is to embed and uphold human rights in all relevant policies, laws, institutions, programs, and decision-making processes. We cannot continue nature conservation without a very clear focus on rights. This is essential. It has to be clear. The fourth recommendation is that we must halt the drivers of biodiversity loss and climate breakdown and halt the threats and violence against who are, those who are defending our planet, who are defending life. We talk about more investment being needed in nature conservation and in conservation efforts. Yes, that is true. But unless we address the drivers of biodiversity loss, the perverse incentives of biodiversity loss, we cannot talk about continuing a proactive and positive uh, conservation of nature. So we must halt those drivers of biodiversity loss. 
And the, first, the fifth recommendation from our report is to develop human rights-based financing as a key lever for equitable and effective implementation of global commitments. And I know my time is up, so I won't take any more time, but I think this is a, a new, I haven't heard anybody else beyond the consortium and a couple allies talk about human rights-based financing. What would that look like? What is that? And I think for us is that it does recognize that the financing has to be given to indigenous people with the understanding that they have the right to use it on their own terms and that they have their rights recognized so that the financing is not tied to the donor's interest, to somebody else's interest. Human rights-based financing also um, addresses the need to have direct access mechanisms to funding. There are too many middlemen between the work indigenous peoples do on the ground and the financing internationally that is internationally available. So how do we make sure that the mechanisms exist for direct financing to indigenous people? So I, I'll stop there. Again, I invite you all to talk to some of our members who are here in the audience or to visit our webpage and learn a little bit more about what uh, the Territories of Life report and also what the ICA Consortium is doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ame, for that very um, comprehensive uh, set of recommendations. I'm, I'm sure there'll be some questions on, on those at the end. Um, we're now going to move to the uh, online presentation uh, by Heather Bingham, uh, please, who will be presenting the, the more technical aspects of the uh, report, which was prepared by eight different organizations, but with the World Conservation Monitoring Center uh, acting as one of the lead uh, technical service providers. So over to you, Heather. Um, hear me okay and see the slides. Um, so yeah, as, as Terence said, um, I'm Heather Bingham. I work at the UN Environment Programme World Conservation Monitoring Center. Um, and we played a, a key role in the global spatial analyses, both for the report that Ame has been talking about and for its companion report. So firstly, report one uh, is the State of Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities, Lands and Territories report. Uh, so this is the report that Terence mentioned that was led by WWF. So the focus of this report was on all lands that are owned or governed uh, by IPLCs for which we could get spatial or GIS data. Um, a couple of things to note before I start um, getting into the detail of the results. Um, we know that the data set is incomplete. So again, this is just areas where we could access publicly available spatial data. We know that there are many, many more lands um, out in the world that are owned or governed by IPLCs that aren't reflected in this data set. Uh, so when you're looking at the maps, just keep this in mind that you, you shouldn't assume that there are no IPLC lands in the areas that aren't covered in those maps. Um, and the other thing just to note is that with all the maps that I'll present, or most of them, um, we have used a, a grid to obscure specific boundaries. Um, and this is uh, due to the data being very variable in quality between different countries and also an acknowledgement of the fact that a lot of this was publicly available data and um, we don't know the details necessarily of how those boundaries were defined and whether that was done with free, prior and informed consent. So that's the reason for not showing specific boundaries on the maps. So the first key finding um, is that um, IPLC lands cover at least 32% of the world's land. Uh, the data set that we brought together covered 132 countries. So again, many countries weren't included, but um, it was a significant increase uh, on the 87 countries that were included in the Garnet data set that Terence mentioned earlier. And obviously, at least 32% being, being covered is a, a hugely significant finding. So just to build on this and how significant it is, um, the infographic on the left uh, shows the proportion of the world's land that's in IPLC lands, which again is 32% at least. Um, and it also, the middle circle shows uh, the proportion of the world's land that is both owned or governed by IPLCs and also is in good ecological condition. Um, so that's 20.5% of the world's land. Um, and I'll come back to that finding again a bit later. 
The infographic on the right shows the level of overlap between IPLC lands and uh, protected areas that are governed by the government or private actors. Um, it's less than 15%, both for IPLC lands and for IPLC lands in good ecological condition. Um, and I'm just pointing this out to make the point that uh, the results that I'll go on to describe can't be attributed to overlapping protected areas because many of these areas are outside of them. So the second finding is um, that 36% of the area globally covered by key biodiversity areas overlaps with IPLC lands. Um, this is hugely significant because um, we know from the most recent Protected Planet reports that protected areas, formal protected areas, are still not um, protecting a, a large proportion of the world's key biodiversity areas. So um, there's a huge, huge role here for IPLCs um, in um, as, as leaders and collaborators on protecting and conserving those areas. Um, the, so the next finding is um, of um, areas of global significance for uh, ecosystem services. Um, sorry, my notes seem to be wrong for this. Um, areas of global significance for ecosystem services uh, overlap, a third of those areas overlap with indigenous peoples and local communities lands. Um, so again, this is demonstrating that IPLC lands are vital not just for biodiversity, but also for providing the ecosystem services that sustain human populations, uh, both within those areas, but also far outside of their borders. We then looked at um, coverage of different ecoregions. Uh, so of the 847 terrestrial ecoregions, 75% uh, overlap to at least some extent with IPLC lands. So when we talk about achieving ecologically representative uh, networks of protected and conserved areas, um, <clears throat> it's, clear that, it's clear that IPLC uh, lands are extremely important in, in achieving that. We also looked at land in good ecological condition, um, and that amounts to 64% uh, of the extent of IPLC lands. Um, and actually, if you expand that to look at areas in either good or moderate ecological condition, it's over 90% of IPLC lands. So these these areas are overwhelmingly being maintained in, in very good condition for biodiversity. But they also face threats. So one thing that we looked at was um, an index of potential future development pressures from commodity driven sectors. Um, and we found that over 25% of IPLC lands could face high development pressures in the future. These aren't inevitable pressures, but um, it's it's a risk and it's something that by being aware of it, um, we can act now to, to prevent this. And much of that area that might face future threats is currently in good ecological condition. Um, I don't want to repeat what Arme said, but just briefly, um, <clears throat> report two um, is, uh, the, the analysis was the global spatial analysis of the estimated extent of territories and areas conserved by indigenous peoples and local communities as part of the Territories of Life 2021 report. Uh, this differed from the first report that I mentioned in that the focus was more specifically on potential ICCAs. And the way that we defined that was um, through two different data sets. The first was known ICCAs for which we already have GIS data. Um, and the second is lands owned or governed by IPLCs that are also in good ecological condition. Um, so by combining those two data sets, um, we were able to come up with essentially a proxy for potential ICCAs. And in doing so, um, we found that at least 21% of the world's land is within these areas. 
Um, again, looking at some of the other measures we looked at for the previous reports, um, these potential ICCAs similarly are very, very important for ecological representation, uh, covering at least 66% of the world's ecoregions. Uh, again, huge, hugely important for coverage of key biodiversity areas, covering 22% of their extent. We added a couple of additional analyses that we didn't look at for the, the first reports. Uh, the first found that 33% uh, of intact forest landscapes are within IPLC lands, so clearly very important for, um, for forests. Um, and similarly, a third of the data set identified as the global safety net uh, for biodiversity and climate mitigation uh, is within potential ICCAs. Um, and again, very similar to the finding in the, the earlier reports, um, many of these areas are potentially at risk in the future. So 16% of that area of potential ICCAs uh, could face high development pressures in the future. So the bottom line essentially is that the leadership and contributions of indigenous peoples and local communities are going to be essential to achieving the ambitions under the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, including conserving 30% of the planet, if that is adopted as, as one of the targets. Um, but crucially, IPLC lands shouldn't be counted towards that target until their custodians have given their consent. Um, and it should be accompanied by appropriate forms of recognition and support as defined by those IPLCs to enable them to continue to maintain uh, these areas with all of their important bio biological and cultural and spiritual values. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you. And I will hand back to Terence. So thank you very much, Heather. Um, so the report you just heard about um, was very much from the technical side of things, trying to pr provide you with the evidence um, behind a lot of the advocacy towards the role of IPLCs, lands and territories for the 30 by 30 target. Um, I've heard at this Congress people say that maybe there should be a, uh, with it, a sort of sub-element within that 30 by 30 target to um, explicitly recognize the, uh, the customary tenure of IPLC lands as part of the 30 by 30. Um, so I know a lot of work has gone into this by the ICCA consortium and many of the other indigenous peoples here, and we would uh, like to support them in their efforts. So now we will hear from one of those organizations which is behind this report, um, WWF, and um, I will hand over the mic to uh, Joost Monfort. Hello? Um, good afternoon, everybody. Or good morning, still, I don't know. Um, so thank you for having me here. My name is Joost van Montfort. I work with WWF uh, International and one of the organizations supporting the development of the state of IPLC lands and territories report. Um, and I don't want to take time away from uh, the people after me who are going to talk more to the uh, recommendations. Um, and this report was to help them in their advocacy efforts. So I think that's important. A few things I want to flag. Um, so this is actually the first time those two reports again meet. Uh, so we started off together. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, to see how those reports uh, support each other in analysis and recommendations. And I think it's timely that it's now uh, helping and support advocacy at these events uh, and, and upcoming negotiations. Um, let me check. Um, so maybe also on the report itself. So we are, uh, as WWF, one of the uh, organizing supporting organizations, but 
I want to flag this is a collective effort with uh, many different kind of organizations, conservation organizations, rights-based organizations, uh, academic organizations. Oh, um, maybe I do that, do that to the end. <laughs> um, so also important to know uh, the big conservation organizations almost all supported it. So I think that's, uh, and I will get back to that later why that's important. Um, so and we came together with the shared goal to better understand, highlight, and support IPLCs in their advocacy. Um, and I think getting that alliance together is also, you know, it shows the potential impact. If we put our efforts and our uh, uh, interests together, then I think we are able to, to do much more than each for their own account. Um, and in support, obviously, of the uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. Um, also to flag that, um, so this report, uh, we launched it in June, uh, but we're also considering to have uh, next iterations where we can take on uh, other uh, uh, elements, other uh, aspects. Um, but I think what is important there, what we want to do is expand this coalition. So uh, we're, we're 14 now and it could be uh, much more. Um, and what is key is that what we would want to have is a strong IPLC leadership leading the agenda of research for advocacy. Um, sorry. Um, so uh, I leave the, the recommendations uh, to Giovanni to talk about, but one thing I want to flag is, uh, so there are so many reports out, uh, and I think they're all confirming more or less the same. Uh, so what does this report has to add to it? So, you know, it's, it's a collective effort, and I think that's important. Um, but it also has a call to action in it. Uh, the call to action is a commitment from all the organizations that were, have been contributing to this report. And uh, I invite you to go to the report. Um, I can share the link. It's also in Spanish and French and even Swahili. Um, but what is important there, um, so it's a call to action by all contributing organizations to commit to support IPLCs in different ways, in different forms. Um, so have a look at that. Um, it's also important to, to realize it's a, it's a collective commitment, but that alone won't uh, save uh, the world. So it also requires a whole society approach. Uh, you know, doing this together, uh, governments uh, should be fully protecting uh, the rights and other actors need to respect them. Um, but what I wanted to say here is it, it, it builds a way of helping each other, uh, hold each other accountable. And this is an invitation uh, to the IPLC community also to use the report and its call to action and call on other conservation organizations to support them in their action. So I think that's maybe the last thing I wanted to say here and uh, provide the floor to the next speaker. Oh, sorry, um, you wanted me to talk to who all is on the report, just some names to throw in. So as I said, um, the, the, the major conservation organizations uh, are in, it was ICN, TNC, WCS, uh, the Conservation International, WWF as conservation organization, but also the International Land Coalition was there, uh, indigenous organizations at Aldea, uh, we started off with the ICA Consortium as well, supporting a lot of the work, groundwork. Uh, and then obviously also the, the SGP, uh, the UNEP and other, uh, the WCMC. Uh, so many organizations supporting this work. And it's, as I said, an, an alliance we want to build and make bigger. So people who think, you know, this is something I want to support, uh, join us, support us, please. Thank you. Okay, so then we have Giovanni Reyes from the Philippines, uh, who is a, an honored uh, ICA member, uh, has been uh, also in both reports engaged, so he has been very instrumental in the ICA report, but also been one of the uh, reviewers of the State of IPLC lands reports. Giovanni, good evening, I would say. Can you hear us? Good evening. Yes, yes, uh, I can hear. Uh, Good evening, good afternoon, and uh, good morning. Uh, I was asked to make a uh, comment on the uh, on the two reports, and uh, uh, both reports from the uh, Territories of Life, 
and the IPLC report uh, with uh, WWF uh, are complementary. Uh, first, the custodians of vast conserve areas uh, uh, and uh, the 91% uh, of IPLC lands uh, being on modified, uh, unmodified conditions uh, complement uh, each other. The, uh, the other is I would like to uh, uh, share our interpretation of these findings uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, indigenous uh, peoples, uh, especially on the uh, 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 findings on the violence that, uh, as reported by the Territories of Life, violence that uh, our frontliners uh, uh, suffer from, and also from the IPS report that states that the respect and upholding of human rights um, uh, must be uh, uh, observed. So, if human rights approach uh, will be embedded uh, in the global biodiversity framework, it will be life-affirming and an added strength to the report. The, uh, global uh, the global enlightenment of the capacity, extent, and power of indigenous knowledge are in both reports. So the cultural and um, spiritual value that indigenous peoples attach on their lands make them inseparable from the environment so that a human rights-based support to that link will help sustain the source of well-being. And we all know that sustaining and ensuring a clean, safe, and healthy environment is a fundamental human right. We emphasize, as both reports will tell us, that the link between indigenous peoples and nature underlines equity, ecological justice, collective identity, and human dignity, because under indigenous custom or belief, Plunder of the environment is not permitted since simply because there is no knowable benefit under customary law to do so. And since the logical consequence is like signing one's own death sentence. In terms of climate change reversal, the link further builds resilience between society and nature so that any violation of indigenous people's rights to land means a destabilized resilience. So can the global biodiversity framework really function without human rights due diligence? Can the framework ensure nature protection without alignment with inter... Measure targets through tracking and mainstreaming of other effective conservation governance cannot be possible with exclusion of indigenous people's rights. But whether or, whether or not this will be embedded in the global biodiversity framework, indigenous people's position will remain clear. Corporate entities and even governments do not have rights to forcibly exploit indigenous lands and resources without the free and prior informed consent of indigenous peoples. And make, make, we make this clear, this is not being anti-development, but simply an assertion of rights that generations of legitimate dissent will show is a defense for the integrity of nature. We just want a people-centric development that is rights-based. So it is for these reasons that we conduct capacity building through mapping. Environmental education does not come from schools only. Education environment thrives in centers of distinction. Here, the effectiveness and power of indigenous knowledge, history, and to trace land ownership dating back to vested original right makes participatory mapping as a venue where people identify and define issues and goals, and the product designed by them in the concept of self-determined development. This helps communities effectively communicate to the outside world local realities where it matters most, and it strengthens community positions on land uses and the capacity to level the playing field should they decide to engage other sectors. To complement our mapping is inventory of resources to assess and determine the state of health of forests surrounding them.
scientific methods are merged with indigenous knowledge to generate an overall view of the environmental condition. While this may be a mix of clashing of values, the application walks a tightrope where a human rights-based approach ensures that one need not be weakened to, in, to enable the other. When these are declared, when the map areas and inventory areas are declared by the communities, we then send them as community concerned and send them to the UNEP WCMC registry as a means of data protection. Such is the case of 10 indigenous people's community conserved areas that were, that were piloted in the Philippines. It covered an area of 154,868. And when we had this analyzed by our colleagues in the World Resource Institute in Washington, they found out that the area's map is able to hold 10.5 million tons of carbon or equivalent to gas emissions of at least 7 million cars annually. This has pushed the country, it has pushed the Philippines at the forefront of inclusive conservation, at least for the Asia region. The world's 43.5 million square kilometers of indigenous lands await mapping so that the present generation can pass to the next an environment that is intact in a cycle like life itself. So we don't have to wait until 2050 to, to enjoy harmony with nature because it thrives already in indigenous territories. And to translate these rights into wider, wider solidarity, a moratorium on conservation programs without direct commitments to uphold indigenous people's human rights should be observed. That applies to governments and to conservation groups. Governments must uphold international commitments from the onslaught of plunderers. The first step would be an enlightened view, so to speak, to depart from the notion that land ownership exists only where it adheres to civil law and at the expense of indigenous people's principle of land ownership. And for conservation groups to be responsible and responsive allies, to cut and cut cleanly of fortress conservation, conservation for the bias of a colonialist regime that it exudes. There is absolutely no justification to cut people from nature because the eagles, the buffaloes, the pandas, and the orangutans that are, that are purported to be saved are considered stakeholders and living embodiments of guardian spirits by indigenous peoples themselves so that their habitats are considered sacred and therefore unalterable for other land uses. Sacred just as cathedrals and churches are held by Christians as sacred. This is conservation at its pristine best. That's the power of indigenous people's knowledge. The concepts introduced by conservation groups should form additional layers of protection to that indigenous knowledge power. Thank you. by which thank you salamat po um yeah so giovanni touched upon another <laughs> very <Salamat>. important <laughs> dimension which is the registration process um at the national level in the philippines um a very important element is the peer review that uh, the Philippines civil society and the indigenous peoples have developed for the submission of the, the maps and the data to the, the, the UNEP WCMC. Uh, I'd like to uh, just add that tomorrow there will be another session here at the same time at 11.30 where we will go into a little bit more detail about the uh, uh, ICCA registry. Uh, we'll also hear about some of the other methodologies of um, assessing governance from the IUCN uh, Global Protected Areas Program at the national level, um, as well as from the IIED on site level governance assessments, uh, Phil Franks, who's with us uh, today. Uh, we have, I think, uh, a little under 10 minutes now for Q&A. Um, I'd like to open the floor first here in the audience for any qu uh, questions. Uh, we'll try to get the mic to you, or I can repeat the question. First, I have to apologize because I have to leave soon for my another session. Um, I'm Pete Witt from the Chamber Foundation. 
and uh, we are in the ICA registry. And I just uh, wonder what what are the results from this first analysis of what ICA can contribute to a better protection of uh, these areas towards, let's say, the people from the mining companies or the, the loggers or whatever, things like that. Because at this moment, it's only a registry. And how can we, can we upgrade the status of an ICA so that it becomes really something recognized and you should not touch also by outsiders? Okay, well, maybe we could ask uh, Heather to say a few words about some of the, the um, benefits, but certainly the fact that there is some form of international listing is, is seen um, as a way of, of at least a demark you know, indicating that these areas have significant values and some of the extractive industries do uh, take into consideration the data of the WDPA and the ICCA registry to maybe uh, to consider, reconsider some of the activities. Um, I think in terms of uh, tomorrow, there will be a bit more discussion about the legal uh, context of ICCAs. Another element of our global support initiative has been to, to take a very deep analysis around national legal assessments, which will be presented by uh, Natural Justice, which is one of the NGOs. I don't know if anyone else would like to say something on that point. Thank you. I think you raised... Oh. <laughs> You raise an excellent uh, question there about what now once these lands are demarcated. I do think that mapping is the is a really good advocacy strategy and it's a very good first start. But then from there, how do we continue to defend those areas once they've been mapped? And I think for us, the answer lies in supporting the governance, the local governance structures and the rights of those people in those territories. And uh, about how to achieve that, I think the answer as most answers are when working with local communities is it depends. It depends on where and who and what the pressure against them is. Um, but I do think there's been some discussions here in the, in the forum, in the Congress, about some creative strategies that have been used to support territories once they've been mapped and demarcated and registered um, for them to continue the work on the ground. Because yes, I do think that registering is one first step to visibilizing the community and protecting them, but then more needs to be done beyond then. Okay. To me. Thank you. Um, yes? Okay. Uh, Christina and then the lady in the, in the Oh, middle. okay. She no, no, wants go ahead to go first. first. Go ahead, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, first of all. Uh, fantastic and evidence is very clear. So we have no doubt about the contribution of conservation of um, territories of life. But I wonder whether we can shift the attention to what can be done in order to safeguard and secure these territories because they are really under threat in many places. And the process that we are following, I'm talking from my own experience working with other civil society organizations and communities in Indonesia. You know, when we map, we get uh, to proper process and free and prior and so consent and registry at national level to for about 400,000 uh, hectares. And then we have a potential over 4 million hectares in Indonesia alone, and it's underestimate. But then the development processes, food estates, infrastructure building comes in at a speed that is not the speed of these processes. So what can we do? Maybe what solution and mechanism are available? Thanks. Can you just maybe take the three questions now? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Camille Gilles from the University of Lausanne. Um, thank you for the presentation, very interesting. I was wondering, uh, I have a question linked with the first one. Uh, do you think it would help the ICCAs to be recognized as OECM, so over effective area-based management measures? So um, it's an um, official status which is in discussion and will, will be, it will be included in the, into the post-2020 GBF. So what do you think about this status and do you think it would help? Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Susan Hirschberg uh, from the Rural Communities Foundation of Nova Scotia, which is in uh, Mi'kmaq territory, unceded and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, 
In Nova Scotia and in Canada in general, there's a very uh, strong uh, and, and at this point government supported effort to uh, create official, um, it's a sort of different initials, but a, a similar kind of idea of a, in, indigenous led protected areas. So these are specific areas like uh, marine protected areas and land-based protected areas that are run uh, under the explicit stewardship of indigenous peoples. Um, and I'm just not sure what the status of those kinds of uh, initiatives are in other parts of the world. And I don't know if that's something that, because it, it's, it's, it's going very, very well, I believe, in Nova Scotia and Canada. And you know, I don't know if it's a model or, or uh, seen in other parts of the world as well. Okay, maybe I'll ask Ami to, to address that last point in a second, but just uh, some quick uh, responses. So, Christina, one of the options that in UNDP that is being considered is with the SDGs, the integration of, of different benefits from different land uses. So, um, the, the, there's, there's a new idea of essential life support areas. And so, uh, ICCAs and IPLC lands are often providing so many services, carbon, water, livelihoods, biodiversity, and this can somehow be brought into the SDG process. And so that's something that UNDP is, is, is exploring. Uh, on OECMs, it's, I think it's very contextual. In some cases, um, the lands and territories and people will, will, will want to be OECM, not to be considered protected areas. In other cases, they might wish to be considered type D governance protected areas. So we're, we're all well aware of these different options and, and, how, and, and taking a close look at how it's evolving in the CBD context. Um, we would just like to salute Canada for the IPCA's uh, initiative and not just the, the fact that this has been recognized, but also that the government is now providing funding to indigenous peoples and local communities to manage, and I say manage, not just govern um, those areas. Because sometimes there's an assumption that just recognizing them, they will just do that anyway. But they, they need resources in the same way that uh, official protected areas, governments, uh, that governments manage need them as well. But maybe... I'll ask Ame and then anyone else who'd like to respond. Sure, I guess I'll start backwards as well. Um, I think that's an excellent question. One of the things we see with our members in, uh, throughout the world is I think Canada, Australia, the US, certain areas, Sweden, Finland, um, have already made a lot of advances in the legal recognition of indigenous peoples. And so we see the development of these IPAs as something very positive that has happened in a very and I mean, there's mixed opinions about this, but in a semi-respectful way where their rights have been recognized and they have been quite positive. But we have other regions in the world like Nepal where indigenous people aren't even recognized. And so getting to the point of recognizing a protected area, an IPA in Nepal would be nearly impossible because they're, and this is for certain tribes that have been recognized, others have not. The same thing with Latin America. You know, there are a lot of indigenous people where the government doesn't consider them indigenous. And so even getting to that stage of recognition is... A, a hurdle and then getting to the state of an IPA recognition is a whole other um, so it is very contextual I think um, in, in terms of translating the experience. One of the things we try to do at the ICA consortium is sharing knowledge, knowledge sharing and so a lot of our members from Canada a lot of our members from Australia and the US and other places that have had these positive experiences are sharing their experiences with members in other regions that are trying to pursue the same type of recognition and that's been really positive again some of it does translate over and others does not. And then just in terms of the OECMs, I think this is a really important discussion. It's happening quite um, actively in the CBD with the Indigenous Forum, the IAFB, Indigenous International Forum on Biodiversity. And I think the general sentiment is that while OECMs could be a potential opportunity, it also represents a huge hurdle for Indigenous peoples to be able to register their lands as OECMs and be recognized by the government. And so I think while it could be an option and it does offer some opportunities, it's not for everyone and not all Indigenous peoples are interested. And then to Christina's, just really quickly, to Christina's question, I think that's huge, Christina, what you raise. I think the answer or the approach that we take is we have to work at different scales. And so I, 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 we are both involved very, very um, actively in the CBD because I think we have to halt the drivers of biodiversity loss at an international level. And that's a really important discussion that needs to be had. And then at the national level, I think we have to support communities to have that recognition. And then at the local level, how do we get resources for these frontline defenders who are out there literally stopping the vehicles from entering their lands? And so I do think it's a question of scale. And I think it's a question of mobilizing resources throughout the scales. 
So we now have to wrap up. Um, I don't know if you, do you want to say something? So one quick word from you, and then the final word will go to the two online uh, yeah. colleagues. Um, thank you. Um, no, I think also echoing what, what uh, Amy said. So I think what is interesting, and again, those two reports, so I think one gives a global analysis of, of what is the opportunity, what's all possible and what has been achieved. Uh, Territories of Land uh, g gives a great example of what, what all is possible. What are those examples and how, how, to, how to build on that? So I think replicating and, and, and scaling is, is the next step. We had a discussion yesterday with uh, Phil Franks on, you know, there is not one simple solution for this. Um, and, and so also not to the solution, uh, the, the problem uh, Christina has uh, drawn on. But I think what we can do and should do is work on those enabling conditions. And one of those conditions is also making sure that there is the appropriate financial and political support for those uh, ICA initiatives. So thank you for that. Um, Giovanni, I think the floor is yours and then we go to Heather. Please come in. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. If to a human body the most protected is the heart, then at a global scale, the most protected is the ICCA. You destroy the ICCA, then you destroy the, the, the global uh, uh, home the way that when you hurt the heart of a human being, then you kill him. Thank you. Heather, to you. Famous last words. Thanks, Yoss. <laughs> um, yeah, not much to add, really. I think um, everyone's covered a lot of hugely important points in a short time. Um, but just to say, I think that the, the global biodiversity framework does present us with a huge opportunity to be better in the future in terms of implementing it in a way that is rights based. Um, and um, I think we will just need to um, collectively put huge efforts into making sure that that happens and to making sure that um, the, the very real contributions of indigenous peoples and communities are recognized and supported, but crucially in ways that have been defined um, by them uh, and in ways that do support them rather than, than undermining their, their governance and management. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. So I think that's we've come to the end of the session. I'd just like to thank again the uh, Federal Ministry of the Environment from Germany for supporting a lot of the work on ICCAs that uh, UNDP has been delivering. And to remind you that tomorrow, 11.30 a.m., we will have another session going into more detail on some of the uh, tools and methodologies. So thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>